On the evening of May 14, 2020, 44-year-old James Fairbanks travelled to 43rd and Pinckney Street in Omaha, Nebraska, armed with a 9mm semi-automatic rifle. When he arrived, local pastor Matteo Condolucci answered, and what was supposed to be a stern word ended up with Matteo riddled with bullets which rendered him dead. Police soon arrived at the scene and found Matteo lying there in a pool of his own blood. The investigation began. Who would want Pastor Condolucci dead? With no solid leads to go off over the first few days, it looked as if the case was about to go cold. Old. But out of nowhere, James would make a confession to not only the police, rather the local community. His reasonings, reports say, divided people. Sending both an email to the news and posting to the Omaha Scanner Facebook page, James had this to say. Dear media, I'm writing this email to let you know that I killed Matteo Condolucci. Thursday, May 14th around 9.45pm. While out apartment searching and checking the neighbourhoods I wanted to live in, I stumbled across his sex offender registry info. I read where he had molested and raped two children and been convicted twice, yet only served two years in prison for raping children. I see his address was right around the block from where I was looking to move. I drove by and to my horror, he was standing in his driveway pretending to wash his truck, no soap or water, just a rag, while staring at a group of children playing in the street. I watched him for a few minutes and just felt sick to my stomach. He just kept staring at them. The kids thankfully left and he went inside. I went to the driveway and noticed, to my amazement, this twice convicted sex offender had a playground set in his backyard. No fence, just a slide and a playhouse. I felt sick to my stomach. Having had my own experience with these types of predators, I knew the damage he would do to these kids. It agonized me for days. I couldn't sleep. I researched him more and more and found out he had victimized dozens of kids in different states. One of the kids' mothers had created a predator Facebook page about him, trying to warn people. Her son had been assaulted by him when he was five, and the damage he did led to the poor guy to die of a drug overdose years later, and his mom directly blamed that incident on him. I've worked with kids for years who have been victimized, and I couldn't, in good conscience, allow him to do it to anyone else while I had the means to stop him. I'm willing to turn myself in even though I'm confident I wouldn't be caught because it's my opinion that we need to fix this in our society. We cannot let this continue to happen to our children. They must be stopped. I know in this messed up judicial system, that means I will face a far more severe punishment for stopping him than he did for raping kids, but I could no longer do nothing. If you need proof, the gun was a 9mm, the front door was left open, and the TV was on. I will turn myself in as soon as I see this has been released. Regards. The lady who James refers to in his post, Laura Smith, had been fighting for justice against Matteo for over two decades. You see, all the way back in 1993, the pair had moved in together at a property in Ormond Beach, Florida, but it's unclear of their relationship. If we bring the timeline to May of that same year, Laura had gone out on a late night grocery run, leaving her five-year-old son with Matteo. Upon returning, she found her son in the bathroom, crying extensively. The bed was wet. Matteo brushed this off as the five-year-old old wetting the bed, but Laura could sense something was off. He had never wet the bed in his life. The following day, Laura and her son packed their bags and got out of the house. As they were doing so, the young boy whispered, Mommy, I've got something I've got to tell you. She knew instantly. Matteo had sexually assaulted him. According to a report detailing the crime, Matteo was charged with attempted lewd and lascivious assault upon a child after he had touched the boy's private area and made the boy touch his while both were clothed. Matteo pleaded no contest to the charges, but to avoid her son having to go through a trial, Laura approved the plea negotiations that were put forward and Matteo was handed four years worth of probation, was ordered to get drug counselling and was told to stay away from the victim. It was a five-year-old words against a 37 year old man's words. He was manipulative, he was good at lying. The plea deal at least got him on the sex offenders list. Over two decades after this incident, the young boy, now a fully grown adult, had began struggling to come to terms of what happened to him as a child and in 2016 turned to drugs to cope. It was here Laura made a Facebook page warning others about him, making a dozen posts naming Matteo as her son's abuser. This predator preys on single mothers to get his hands on her children. He moves from state to state. He must be stopped. He's been convicted twice, but back on the street. Only one year after Laura's son turned to drugs, he would sadly pass away due to an overdose. Matt, you're a sick, sick man. You did this to my son. You tried to poison me to death, but I lived. 
you killed my son. According to Mateo's son Joe, he recalled childhood being very chaotic and stated the reason his father moved state to state was because Mateo was actually a government informant. Whichever story you believe, the former on at least one occasion was proven true. In 2007, Mateo had been charged for the rape of a 13 year old girl. I've searched the internet far and wide for extra information in regards to the case, but the only information that has surfaced is that he was sentenced to five years in jail, but only served two for good behaviour. One may ask why James took it upon himself to do what he did on that spring day in May, but one look at his employment history gives us an insight to someone who has a deeper connection than we may think. Previously, James had worked in the correction system with sex offenders, and the stories he took back home were horrific. He saw the worst of them, ex-wife Kelly Tomeo explained to reporters. From 2016 through to 2018, James had been employed at the Morton Middle School as a behavioural interventionist. Before then, he had helped troubled youths at a private company. His ex-wife Kelly would go on to say that James was a protective person who after working with young children had mixed feelings of great sadness and was frustrated at how some of the students had been abused but the perpetrators got off with a slap on the wrist. In the end, James handed himself in and although he originally believed that he would get off by way of self-defense, he changed his plea after the prosecution offered him a second degree murder charge. His plea change came as the result of the evidence pointing that he had planned the shooting in advance. As you know, James stated in his letter that he was ready to move to the local area and stumbled across the sex offenders register. Well, the prosecution stated that he'd actually been looking into more than one sex offender to hunt down and had even drew up plans to shoot more people, but for whatever reason, he never did. James would be sentenced to 40 to 70 years, but is eligible for parole after serving 20. The prosecution believes that he has a strong case of being released when that time has been served. We might still be living, but when you molest and rape children and your own child, you automatically took their lives. Yes, we're alive, but we're not the same human beings that we should have been. Amanda Henry lives with memories that will haunt her forever. I've had to live in fear for 34 years. And it has been the worst pain that I could imagine. And so when I finally got the phone call, yes, I, I was relieved. Her father, Matteo Condolucci, was killed in May. Henry says she doesn't hold animosity toward James Fairbanks. The man prosecutors say killed Condolucci. I'm not at all saying I agree with murder. But when you've been violated so many times and the justice system has failed you as many times as it's failed me, that's the only thing you could hope for. Condolucci was found dead inside his home near 43rd and Pinckney. Prosecutors say Fairbanks sent an anonymous email to media confessing to killing Condolucci. In his letter, Fairbanks says he learned of Condolucci's past and couldn't let him victimize any more children. How many more children were going to be hurt? How many more children's lives were going to be taken? They wouldn't stop him. He needed to be stopped. Henry says the abuse started around the time she was six. She says Condolucci forced her to take baths with him and, as she got older, used the abuse as punishment. Henry also says she thinks her father would have hurt more children. When I was packing his house and I found little boy's pants, khaki pants, they weren't new. They had stains on the knees like they had been playing in the yard or something. I found little girl's blouses. I found a pair of little girl's panties. She urges parents to listen to their kids. Do your research. That's what the registry is for. Know who you are allowing your children around. In Omaha, Sydney Gray, 3 News Now. The sex offender I spoke with says the state registry is meant for public awareness and safety. He says it's not a list of people to be attacked. When Jay first heard the motive behind Matteo Condolucci's death, he immediately feared for his family's safety. We're setting ducks. Prosecutors believe James Fairbanks sent this email. It states he killed Condolucci because he saw the sex offender outside staring at children, making him feel sick to his stomach. Jay is a registered sex offender. He worries the homicide will encourage vigilante crimes. You don't go out there and take it into your own hands 
and murder or take the life of somebody else because you weren't happy with the judgment that was made. Jay makes it clear he did not know Condolucci and he's not defending him. Yes, he, he did some pretty rotten stuff. Yeah, granted, it was horrible, horrible stuff. <clears throat> But to say that he doesn't, he didn't deserve a second shot and he was trying to prove himself as, as a, a godly man. Condolucci's son, Joseph, tells us his dad did change after prison, becoming a minister. I believe he was doing his, what, what he could to turn his life around, yeah. I mean, who, who, who's to say, you know, I mean, who's to say, you know, exactly what it takes to you know, turn your life around from, from something like that. Jay calls on state senators to change Nebraska's sex offender registry to prevent something like this from happening again. The safety of which the registry was built on is no longer safe. It's no longer safe for the community. It's no longer safe for the family members of those that are registered. Jay argues the sex offender registry should be for law enforcement only. Back to you. Just absolutely kind of blew my mind that a twice convicted. 
alleged sex offender who I know ha couldn't have any contact with children. It's on his uh, registry information. Has a huge playground in his backyard with no fence. And I mean, I just went home and I felt sick, honestly. Uh, that night, all night, my stomach was in knots. I couldn't couldn't sleep. I couldn't eat. I, I was just thinking about it. Um, as I mentioned in the email, I've worked with kids my entire life. Um, I've had personal experience. Uh, when I was a kid, I personally wasn't uh, molested, but a loved one was, and I don't want to get into that too much because they have chosen not to speak about it, so I don't want to uh, speak for them, but I witnessed it, and um, the situation happened, and then again, like I said, when working, I've watched the kids um, over the years that I've worked with just so many of them combined in me that the, the torment, the pain that they're going through with their abuse that they've suffered. And I've watched them grow up and become drug addicts and just have no self-worth. And, and I've seen, you know, the lifelong uh, suffering that so many of these kids endure at that age because I have such firsthand knowledge. I mean, I think I was just, like it was bothering me. Um, like I said, for the next couple of days, I sat on it. I thought about all the things I could do. I could do that would uh, maybe um, help. I, I thought about going back. Actually, I went back a couple times to look for the kids and go and knock on their, see if I could find out which houses were theirs, and knock on their doors and tell their parents, you know, might want to have this guy not these kids not as close to this guy. And this is what I saw. I couldn't make that connection over a couple of days. I couldn't figure out which kids were in which houses. Um, and finally, it just dawned on me, like, I felt like I need to do something. This has to stop. Oh, yeah, and as I'm doing at home for those couple of days, I'm researching this specific guy, and I'm reading about his crimes, the five-year-old boy that he molested in Florida that grew up addicted to drugs, which, I, like I said, I'd seen a hundred times before. His mom was talking about, you know, the pain he endured uh, lasted the rest of his life until he overdosed on drugs. I, I read about... Uh, the 13-year-old, I didn't read any of the details, but the 13-year-old in Papillion that he had sexually assaulted. At the time, I knew that if there were two convictions, there were dozens more. I mean, that's just the statistics um, with these with these guys. And sure enough, since um, he died, uh, dozens more have literally come out and contacted our family and, been, and talked about their stories and want to express what they went through. And um, very recent too. Not, I mean, within the last few months, victims of his have come forward and contacted us. And I already, I already knew that there would, had to be many, many more of you been convicted twice. I also saw on the registry that somebody had stopped by and verified his address with the sheriff's department. I don't remember the exact date, but it was within a couple of weeks or so. Um, and it just blew my mind. They had to see this giant playground in his backyard, and, and apparently nobody was going to say anything or do anything. And, you know, um, and again, that's a bigger issue, but you know, I, I, I was wondering, is this because it's 43rd and Pinckney? Would this have been allowed on 170th and Maple? Could this guy have get moved into a house by himself and threw a playground up in his backyard and nobody stopped to buy it to say you can't do that or anything? Um, I didn't feel like there was, like I said, anybody I could turn to with all this, so I decided I was going to go over there and uh, threaten him, basically was my intention to go over there and let them know, look, I know who you are. I watched you the other day. If you touch any of these kids, you're not going to get another slap on the wrist from the, from the uh, justice system. I'm coming next time. Next time you touch one of these kids, you're going to deal with me. I brought a gun, uh, as I said, or obviously. Um, I, I, I went, approached his house. He opened the door. He saw me coming. Um, I pulled the gun out, I uh, told him to back up, and I went to have the conversation, or basically just to tell him exactly what I just said. Look, you touch those kids, there's going to be some punishment that's going to come, and it's not going to be another probation or, or slap on the wrist or anything like that. Uh, as soon as I started talking, he came forward, um, and immediately again, he was a six foot, 300 plus pound man, I knew I had to shoot, or uh, who knows what was going to happen again. I mean, I'm willing to take responsibility for the fact that I went over to his house with a gun to threaten him, and 
what happened and what transpired transpired. Uh, my intention was not to walk over there and just shoot him, period. Um, that's what it ended up happening. Um, and I understand that there's consequences for that. But I also uh, I want to point out uh, a, a couple of things also. And that is, um, I've been deeply, uh, I've been deeply grateful and, and appreciate all the support that I've received from, from the Free James Fairbanks campaigns and the petitions and all of those things online. Um, I am asking, though, that those people channel their efforts elsewhere to changing these laws, to actually doing something other than freeing me. Um, I can handle whatever I have coming my way, and if the whole point of all of this is I just get off, then I think we missed a chance to actually do something, and that's that's take this momentum that seems to be out there and freeing me and, and channeling it to the district attorney and the judges and the legislators and go, we need st uh, tougher penalties, we need to stop cutting these deals that allow men like him to, to molest children for decades and and only serve minimum sentences and be allowed to move right back into our neighborhoods um, alone and put up playgrounds in their backyards and just look for their next victims. Um, you know, I wish the DA would go after them the way they're going after me, to be perfectly honest. You know, I get no bail. I'm first degree. There's, I'm in jail with a whole bunch of guys in here that are getting prosecuted for, for not raping children. And they're getting prosecuted harder than a lot of the times we see child molesters. And why that is in the justice system, I don't know. It's got to stop, though, and it's got to change. Quite honestly, I don't think me and Mr. Condolucci should have ever come in contact. Um, you should have been there. And you, you, you're a repeat sex offender. You just shouldn't be alone living amongst kids in a neighborhood. At that point, you should be either in prison or in some kind of sex offender home. I have friends that are in the drug and alcohol um, programs, and, and they're graduates of programs, and they live together. And, and I just don't understand why we allow sex offenders, of all people, to just live alone in their neighborhoods and, and kind of run and do whatever they want, seemingly unsupervised, because if he's being supervised and he's allowed to throw up a playground in his backyard and sit there in his a driveway, in my opinion, picking out his next victims, then there's something really wrong with the system. Um, again, I mean, uh, and sorry, I have a couple of notes here. I just want to make sure I hit a couple more things. Uh, I'll gladly change my plea uh, if any kind of uh, the district attorney will, will at least agree to look into their own um, practices of these deals. I know um, if a state legislature will propose a bill, and I don't mean uh, it has to get voted on and approved and become law. I mean, the second um, something like that happens, I'll gladly take responsibility for my, my role in this and step out of the way and let um, the people of Nebraska, the people that are supporting me, finish uh, kind of getting that uh, intact so we can help better protect our children. I, I just don't want all the people that are behind me. And, and again, I, 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 the letters I receive, the petitions, everything is just... It's wonderful, it's just, I'm okay. This isn't about me. Um, this is, needs to be about protecting the kids. Otherwise, my kids and grandkids are gonna grow up here and it's gonna be the exact same things that they're gonna have to deal with growing up that um, people like Mr. Condolucci have always been doing. And again, that's about all I got. Um, that's the points I wanna make if you wanna ask any questions. So when you went over there, you said you weren't even able to get out what you wanted to say to him before he started coming no, toward you? I, uh, I, again, my lawyer's probably gonna be upset because I'm not sure how much of this he would like me to say, but the truth is I walked in, uh, he answered, he opened up the screen door as I was walking up. He walked in, um, I started the sentence and then honestly I noticed a woman's purse on the couch. And, that threw me completely off. I was very sure he was alone. Turned out he was apparently because nobody called the police for a couple of days. Nobody reported anything. But I saw that and I kind of froze and I started stuttering to be honest. I think I got out. I know who you are. I know what you've done. And then I noticed the uh, woman's purse and then he, I think, took that as a side chance to run at me because I, I seemed to be, you know, caught. Pretty
for a second not understand. I didn't want to. I didn't want to do this in front, do whatever it was going to end up happening, or have this conversation, or obviously be there and never be an innocent victim. That was also um, in there. Again, I believe it, it was dark, but I believe it was a woman's purse. I could be wrong. Only the police and the DA, I guess, could really say that. But that's what I. That's what I thought I saw, and that made me pause. And I think again, he took my pause as a chance to kind of come at me. The uh, Condolucci's daughter. I interviewed her a couple of times, talked to her in person on the phone. She says she 100% supports you. And how do you feel about that? I mean, it's both amazing and not surprising at the same time. I mean, I know the pain she's had to endure. Uh, watched it again with loved ones with kids. Um, I feel horrible for her. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure this brought up a lot of a lot of torment um, to the forefront that maybe she was working through and this brought it all up. I don't know. I haven't had a chance to speak to her, but um, I can't even imagine what she's had to go through uh, having that monster be her father and then all of this, but I, I definitely appreciate um, her support. A lot of people have talked about vigilante justice. Do you believe what happened here was vigilante justice? Was that your point? I've heard, I've heard that. I don't, I don't, I don't know. No, I mean, I was a guy who honestly thought he was protecting a few kids from getting sexually assaulted by a predator that was that was setting them up or, or, or stalking them. Um, as far as vigilant, I mean, I get the arguments on both sides that this has to be stopped. Obviously, I get that. I also get the argument that we can't have everybody just picking up guns and going and executing sexual offenders. So I do understand. Um, as far as vigilante justice, I, I just, like I said, I saw some kids I thought were going to be hurt, and I decided to try to do something to stop it. That's as far as I get into the, what you want to label it as. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and. I, I have also done another story on, uh, you know, with a sex offender, a convicted sex offender, who says that now they're they're afraid because their, you know, names and addresses are posted online for anybody to come come do that. Well, what do you what would you say to you know others who, you know, are seeing sex offenders living in their area and, uh, you know, upset about that? Well, as far as the sex offenders that are upset, um, or maybe they feel feel in fear or. Uh, scared, uh, vulnerable because of um, what I did, you know. Congratulations, now you know what your victims feel like. I don't really care. Um, deal with it. You decided to make those decisions. Now you can live with the consequences of your decisions. As far as people that, other people that have them living in their neighborhoods, um, honestly, be on, be, watch out because if you're not as informed as I am on these, you know if you have a guy that's convicted, there are very high likelihood that there's many, many more victims, and their chances of reoffending are, are extremely high. So I mean, just be vigilant and, and keep your kids away. Definitely, in, in this situation, um, I didn't feel, and, and again, that's a larger. Um, conversation about the, the neighborhood that he was in. I didn't feel there was the community continuity. I live there, you know, I spent my time in North Omaha. The community continuity to just raise awareness in the neighborhood about this guy. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to act. But I don't know that that's true in every neighborhood. Hmm. What would you like people to know about you? I mean, is there anything else you want people to know about you? character <laughs> for, for me I've never done anything like this um, before I just hope they know that it wasn't a rash decision it wasn't a decision to go over there and just kill somebody um, it was a decision I, I've taken it very personally because my, like I said my own life experiences and the damage I've seen um, this abuse due to kids and I honestly didn't know what, um, I, how I was going to take if, you know, a month later I saw his face on the news and there was another victim and I knew and I didn't do anything. And this time I actually knew, or I've 
heard it afterwards so many times it had been helpless to stop it this time I was I knew what he was planning and I, I just felt like I could not sit back and find out later that he did something and I didn't do anything yeah how do you how do you feel about you know the support with so many people you know sending you letters and, and as well as putting money on your books here at, at the Douglas County Jail you know showing you that kind of support I mean it's been like I said it's been wonderful I've read letters from you know 17 year old kids that were abused in their growing up and all the way up to people in their 60s that have sent me letters and, and have said you know thank you I, I I'm glad. I can. I know one of the 17-year-old girls said, you know, even though he wasn't my uh, perpetrator, I felt relief. And if, if if there is any, and again, this is a, I understand the murkiness of it um, as far as the vigilante, and this isn't the way to go. But I mean, if it did bring relief and inspired anybody to or help anybody, I'm glad. But more than anything, I want them to channel that, stopping them in the future. And, uh, you know, I pretty much write everybody that's written me a letter back, and I and I tell them those exact words: is thank you so much, um, and please feel free to write me any time. But also make sure you're writing your your legislators and your district attorneys, and you're calling them and letting them know, because again, freeing me is not the point. Um, if I wanted to be free, I think uh, if the district attorney is being honest, once the evidence is all looked at, I would be. I. I don't believe they would have ever connected me with Mr. Condolucci and what happened that night. Um, I sent an email out because the point wasn't to free me. The point was to, to, to get people um, where after the incident happened, I didn't. I felt a minor bit of relief for those kids, and then I just thought, I, there's just it's not a real impact. I mean, honestly, it's not. Um, there's still, what, hundreds of more in the neighborhood. I mean, they're everywhere up in North Omaha, everywhere all over the city, I'm sure. I just, I talk about North Omaha because that's where I live. And, um, you know, and, and, and obviously I couldn't and I wouldn't want to and I don't want other people to just pick up guns and do it the way I did. I knew in order to make the real change, it had to get back to uh, the legislator, the district attorney's office. And, you know, I just felt like maybe maybe I could use this incident, even though it didn't go the way I wanted it to go, um, as a positive in the end, and try to make this this all be worth something. And again, that's more important to me than getting out of here. Yeah, I mean, you know, have what have you kind of told yourself? I mean, at this point, because you know, seemingly you may be in in jail at least for quite some time before trial and. You know, who knows what happens after that? My hope is um, the district attorney or a state legislator, like I said, um, proposes or at least promises to do reviews of, uh, of the current laws and how they and their and their system of plea bargains with with child molesters. Um, and then I hope I can make a, a deal uh, with the prosecution that makes me, that allows me to take accountability for what I did and also takes into account who he was and what my motives were. But that's, again, less important to me. Um, if, if I'm in prison for the rest of my life and these laws get changed, um, I'm okay with that. I can sleep that night. Okay. James, thank you. Is there anything else that you wanted to add that we didn't talk about? Uh, no, I think that's about it. I appreciate it. Yeah. And, Jay, and, I, and I want to confirm you 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 did write the uh, the anonymous email to to us. Okay. I, did, and I know I got pulled over in Burke County. Um, the DA had mentioned that in my uh, my bail. Your bond thing. review. Uh, yeah. Bond review. Yeah. yeah. I just wanted to make it clear. I had sent the uh, email. I had every intention of turning myself in that night. I was on my way to see Branched Oak Lake, which my family and I lived there for four years. It was kind of the last time my family was all together uh, before the divorce and, and, and everything. I and just kind of wanted to see it one more time, and then I was turning around and driving to Douglas County when I got pulled over. Um, but anyway, it was every intention of turning myself in and facing this. And honestly, what you said, you know, uh, also, I 
don't believe, as far as me spending the rest of my life in prison, if the DA and I can't come to a deal, I don't believe I will spend the um, rest of my life in prison. I don't believe that the DA is going to be able to find 12 Omahans that are going to be willing to send me to prison for the rest of my life uh, for stopping him from raping more kids and assaulting more kids. I just don't. And if I'm wrong on that, then again, I can sleep at night. I'll raise as much awareness of the greater issue. Uh, the bigger reason I would rather take the plea is to get out of the way and let the focus uh, be more on changing the laws and not on, I'm done, I've been sentenced, I've taken a plea, and now we can focus on changing the system and not spend the next year and a half focusing on it. Some people but if it does come to the trial, I'll raise as much awareness as I can for the next year and a half, two years, however long it's for trial, and then take my chances that I don't believe the DA will be able to find 12 Omaha's to send me away for the rest of my life. Some people have called you a hero. You know, what do you think about that? Do you think you're a hero? No. Uh, that's, I appreciate it again. That's, I don't think I really want to respond to that. It's kind of silly. I just did. I'm just trying to help those kids. That's it. So, right. uh, that's, but yeah, no, that's about all I got. Okay. Well, James. Uh, I could be wrong, uh, but I just, like I said, I feel like with the support that's out there, it's, I have a good chance of raising the awareness uh, with all this and actually, again, kind of handing off the football and allowing the uh, the people of Omaha to take it and cross the finish line and get these laws changed. And like I said, I, if I'd rather not be a martyr <laughs> than be a martyr if it was possible, but I'm not willing to sacrifice uh, my freedom for making a, a larger point, and that's the biggest point of